Well, good evening and welcome to Sunday evening service. Good evening. Let's stand for opening prayer, please. Sister Lynch, would you open us in prayer, please? Amen. Amen. All right, Reverend Ledger is going to come forward and lead us in song. Amen. All right. Okay, let's turn in our hymnals to 393. 393. Just like his great love. 393. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. And never No matter what I do, I've sinned against his love of his. But when I knelt to pray, confessing all my guilt to him, the sin clouds rolled away. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Sometimes the clouds of trouble be dim the sky above I cannot see my Savior's face or I doubt his wondrous love but he from heaven's mercy seat beholding my despair in pity burst the clouds between and shows me he is there it's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away it's just like Jesus to keep me day by day it's just like Jesus all along the way it's just like his great love when sorrows clouds overtake me and break upon my head when life seems worse than useless and earthly hopes are dead I take my grief to Jesus then, nor do I go in vain, for heavenly hope he gives that cheers like sunshine after rain. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his grace. 
great love Oh, I could sing forever Of Jesus' love divine Of all his care and tenderness For this poor soul of mine His love is in and over all And when When Jesus whispers, peace be still, and rolls the clouds away, it's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Amen. Good singing tonight. Amen. Let's try 324. 324 in your hymnal. Come everyone who is thirsty. Amen. 324.
this is a time we go to prayer, but if you have a current pressing testimony or a praise report, we'd like to hear it. Well, it's been a blessing having you and Brother Lynch here. We've enjoyed it. Amen. 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 He's good at that. Amen. Amen. All right. We want to continue to pray for Brother Wooten. The Lord get him up and heal him completely. And we want to pray for Brother Joe Perez, for Dave Warren. And who else do we have? Robert Sandiford, Dave Walsh, and anybody else that's sick here needs healing. Sister Foster? Okay. Oh, yes, we want to pray for Brother Greg that he brings a message tonight. Absolutely. God's anointing be upon him. Amen. Amen. Yes, we want to continue to pray for the people in the Ukraine and for God to rise up and let his enemies be scattered there. Anybody else? Uh, I went to a job show last week and uh, it was such a place to uh, work. Okay. All right, I know I'd like prayer. Who else would? All right, let's stand for prayer. Brother Doug, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. All right, the ushers are going to come forward and we'll take the evening offering. in our hearts, pulverize the hard stones in our hearts. Just give us what we need this night, God, and we will ever praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.
Well, thank you all for your giving, and thank you as always, David, for the beautiful offertory. Reverend Ledger is going to come forward and lead us in another song. All right, let's turn in our hymnals to um, 335. 335. Let him have his way with thee. 335 in your hymnal. All right, let's open up our hearts and see what the Lord has for us tonight through Brother Greg. Good evening. Good evening. We're going to open up with uh, John 3.16. Everybody knows that. You'll probably quote it, most everyone in here. But I don't know if everybody understands it correctly. We're going to open up with uh, John 3.16. I appreciate everybody standing in reverence to God's word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise God. I thank you, Father. I bless you. I praise you. Lord, I pray that you open up everyone's hearts so they will hear this message, Lord. I pray, Father, that people will take account of everything they say and everything they do after this day, Father. I pray, Father, that people will, will appreciate everything you've done, Father. But most of all, Lord, I pray that you will open up their hearts. You will give each and every one, including myself, conviction, Father, and that we will live for you, 
blood. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, today, and it's funny how everything lined up because people are talking about uh, the Sunday school, the, the, the preaching earlier. A lot of things were lining up. And then during, um, <laughs> during roll call, we were talking about rules. The Bible was saying, you got to just keep on breaking up rules. You keep breaking rules. And uh, I remember earlier he was saying, you know, before we started out with one or two rules, and then it came to four, and then it came to seven, then it came to 10 and 22, and it's probably like 30 or something rules, and it's probably like 30 or something unwritten rules. But there are a lot of rules because it should be nice and simple with a couple rules, but then there's someone that comes along and finds something to just mess something up, and then they got to come up with a new rule for that and a new rule for that. And it's like that in this world. The first rule and commandment from God to Adam and Eve was not to eat from the tree of knowledge. You can do anything you want, but don't eat from the tree of knowledge. And they ate from it. That's when sin nature came in. Then eventually through uh, Moses, it, it went to ten commandments. It went from one commandment to ten commandments. And it just keeps getting further and further because we have a sin nature. In our society now, we have man-made laws, some from the Bible and some that are not from the Bible. If you break a law and you get caught, you will get arrested and go to court for it to be judged whether you're guilty or not. Sometimes whether you're uh, guilty or you're not guilty, just to be accused, they will take you down and say, you know what, you're getting arrested. Important. They always say this important thing to you. They say, when you're arrested, they say you have a right to remain silent. (laughs) If you give up that right to remain silent, everything you say can and will be, be held against you in a court of law. They're giving you a warning to keep your mouth shut. And some people, if you look at these little law shows or these TV shows, these cop shows, they're like, oh, but I didn't mean to and this. And they're like, shh, be quiet. <laughs> so um, in that, before you go down, when they read you your rights, you get arrested, you have to go to court. And in the court, they're trying to prove whether you're innocent or guilty. They're giving you a fair chance here. And you have a, you have a prosecutor who wants to find out, say everything that's bad against you. You want to get bigger, you want to get up all the evidence against you to sh- prove that you're guilty. I mean, even if they know you're, you're uh, not guilty, a lot of times it's for their own career, they'll still make sure that they convict you because it's their job to do it. That's their job, that's their livelihood. That's how they get paid is to convict people or get people to um, get people to say, okay, I'm guilty, you, you know, let's, Let's make a little plea bargain. You know, you go for this amount and that amount. And then they'll uh, dig up as much, as much dirt and garbage and every bad thing you've ever done, they're going to dig it up and they're going to bring it to trial to make you seem guilty. And then they, they always they hire an investigator or they have an investigator, a private investigator that follows you around, who goes through your past, looks for everything you've done, you know, uh, wherever you're going, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen on TV that where they had uh, people with insurance frauds or people who say that they're disabled and they're like, oh, I'm hurt and I have a case, I can't walk. And then they have a private investigator go and, and kid them on tape and they're up on a roof hammering everything <laughs> and, and doing and lifting things up. I've seen one where someone was on a roof and then they slipped and fell, and boom, it hit the ground, and they had it all on tape, and this guy was supposed to be hurt, and then they made some kind of joke out of it. They said, yeah, he wasn't disabled, but he is now, and they all started laughing. I was like, that's kind of cruel. But everywhere you go, there's, you know, the prosecutor has this private investigator that's digging up dirt on you. He wants to find something so, you know, he can get paid. He can go to the prosecutor and say, here, here, here's all the dirt there is. And they're following you around. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling before that someone's following you around. Being from New York, you know, you got to always know your surroundings. 
And sometimes, you know, you're walking. Oh, don't need to look at that. Can't you look back? And then you look back again quick. <laughs> sometimes you'll catch somebody. Say, I knew it. <laughs> but you have to be careful. Anyway, of your surroundings. You always have to watch, especially if you're in New York. But they put so much money into prosecuting you that they'll dig up all of this dirt. And, if, and once you're in there, once you're going to court, whether you're innocent or guilty, falsely accused or whichever, you have to get yourself a lawyer because you don't understand the legalities of it, of everything. If anyone who goes before court without a lawyer knows that they're a foolish person because nine out of 10, you know, you're gonna end up going to jail. I mean, if you look in jail, there's always people, they always have their glasses. When they're on the street, they never had glasses, they have their glasses on. They learn the law because, you know, they want to make sure they don't want to go to jail. So they try to learn the law because sometimes they can't afford a lawyer. But everyone will tell you, if you get in big trouble, you have to get a lawyer, a good lawyer too. And that lawyer knows all the legality. And then he, what he does, he tries to find out all the goods. First, he wants to get all, all the right evidence. Because if you're being uh, convicted of something, he wants to come up with some kind of reasonable doubt. That's like from the scales of justice, you want to say, well, there's more evidence that he didn't do it than that he did. And uh, he want to uh, prove by a preponderance of the evidence that, you know, that you're innocent. And that lawyer usually costs a lot of money. You don't want to get a court-appointed lawyer because they don't care. And, that, and what they'll do is, is that lawyer and that prosecutor will battle each other to try and, um, to tr for your life, your life is on the line. And they will battle and they will battle and they will go back and forth. And a prosecutor saying everything bad you did, he did this, he did that, here's our evidence, I'm producing this. And you might try to get someone to come in and, and you know, say, oh no, he's a nice person, he's a good person, he's a great person, leave him alone. And then the prosecutor will come and say, and, and will have dirt on that person to try and say, this, you, you, you want to disclaim everything he says because, you know, he's a liar. And the lawyer will continue fighting for you. Then you have a jury of your peers. And that's everybody who sits there who's, who's uh, going to judge what's like, going to be your outcome. And they're supposed to be people just like you. A lot of them are people who wasn't able to get out of jury duty. I know I've gotten out of a few. And then you have the judge who's going to make the final ruling. And you have a stenographer, someone who sits there. Everything you say, they're recording. Every word, everything is being said, they're being recorded. So if you slip up and say something foolish, and then try and say something different, they'll call a stenographer. They said, uh, could you repeat what he said? Yeah, he said that, um, that he did it. You know, it's like, no, I, uh, that was a mistake. What's going on here, right? So they put all this work into that. And uh, after, after the hearing, let's say you're free, you're happy. You know, the guy, you know, he, he's happy, he, he leaves. And if you're convicted, you're sitting there like, oh, man. And it's a dark, gloomy thing when you're convicted. But you realize everything you put in it to become free. I mean, even in the lawyer will even call out some of the good stuff he did. He'll say, well, this guy might be guilty. He might be a drug dealer. He might be a murderer. But he did some good things. You know, he gave out turkeys on Thanksgiving. <laughs> like on TV. <laughs> he, 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 he helped at the soup kitchen or something to try and, you know, lessen the sentence some. But in the end, if he's guilty, he has to sit there and await his judgment. And if they say guilty, he sits there. And the judge says, you're guilty, now stand up and face, you know, your sentence. And before he says face your sentence, he says, is there anything you would like to say before sentence, before you're convicted and we give sentence to you? And that's got to be the coldest thing in the world. If that's time for you to grovel. You know, if ever there's a time to grovel and beg and plead, that's it. And the guy usually gets up and he says, oh, 
I'm sorry. It was a misunderstanding. Help me. Please don't you know, send me for the rest of my life. And there's some woman out in the, in, in the, out there that's always yelling out, that's my baby. And then <laughs> it happens every time, right? They're like, order in the court. And then, <laughs> and then when, um, when it's over, after you finish playing, they'll say, okay, you're guilty of whatever time. They might even say life. And then a person falls down. He's like, no, no. And, and, and you know, the family's distraught. And, this, and this, it's a horrible thing. And a lot of times people wonder why did I get myself in that trouble in the first place. And you think about all these things, and I took my time to explain all of these things that people go through because it's interesting how much we fear going to jail. How much we fear, because it is a horrible place. <laughs> let's, let's get that right. It's a horrible place, but so much we prepare. We make sure we have a lawyer and and it's funny that when you go before a judge or, you know, everybody on the street, they're the baddest guys in the world. They got their, you know, little outfits on. But when they come, when they come into court, they have the glasses. They have the thing. They're speaking politely, yes, yes, please, and thank you. They're the nicest people in the world. And when you see them, you say, man, you wasn't like that the other day when you cursed at me. But when they come before the judge, it's extremely important. And if any of us was accused of a crime, we didn't commit, we had to go before a judge. Let's say something like murder, that would pretty much take our whole life. We would be humble, we would go down there and we would prepare. We would make sure we have a good lawyer, we would make sure our family's there, we would make sure that we get every evidence possible. Now, why is it that we prepare so much for this courtroom? For man, but when, the, when we hear of the judgment of the Lord, we're not worried about it. There will be a judgment. This day of judgment, also known as a final judgment, is when Jesus, the Son of God, will judge the living and the dead. Before destroying the old heaven and earth, which are corrupted of sin. Sin can be defined as anything that opposes God's will and law. To engage in sin is to disobey or abuse his laws because the urge to sin resides in human nature, the sin nature. Mankind is corrupted and somewhat driven by immoral inclinations that live in all people. This is a conscience of the fall into the sin in the Garden of Eden. Before creating his new heaven and earth, God must do away with anything that could produce or bear sin into his new creation. When Adam and Eve fell, that's when the sin nature came upon us. When, he, when they were tricked by the devil, that's when the sin nature came in us. And a lot of times we think, well, we can, you know, we, we can handle this ourselves. We can take care of it, but we can't. Just like all the breaking of the rules. Without Jesus Christ to come in and change us, we can't change ourselves. We're going to keep making those mistakes. And if you think you can solve it, you can't. Jesus Christ will act as justice, will act as the justice of the last judgment. As the Bible states in John 5.22, for the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Now the person I just finished speaking of in John 3.16, he's going to be at the righteous seat. He's going to be the judge. He's going to be the jury. And he's going to be the executioner. He's going to make the final call. First Peter 4.17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Us Christians, judgment must come to the house of God. And if at first, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when you sin, what you're doing is you're bringing a spiritual death. Now, there's a heaven and there's a hell. Whether you believe it or not, there is a heaven and a hell, and I'd hate 
for you to go before the judgment seat and not know and say and have an excuse for Jesus. Imagine that, have an excuse for Jesus. Jesus, who came down rich in heaven, came down to die for us. He was beaten up, stripped of his clothing, uh, beaten bloody, ridiculed, spit on, whipped with lashes where everything, he, it's just horrible what they did to him. And that's man, that's, that, that's all of us. But he did all of that because there had to be a redemption for our sin. He did that so that we may live. He did that so we can make it into the new kingdom. He did that so we can live for the rest of our lives. Now imagine going to this judge and telling him, uh -huh. well, you know, Jesus is going to be like, I gave everything for you to escape this judgment and you chose not to come. Second Peter 2, chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment, he didn't even spare the angels that sinned. I mean, you could say he has more, more mercy on us than he did the angels, but... That time is he's given us a certain time. And we keep talking about uh, what's happening in Ukraine and peace. And I hope there is peace. But even as the word says, things are going to get bad. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be all sorts of madness is going to happen. And then you're going to know as we're supposed to be the watchmen, we're supposed to watch and know that the time is coming, that there's a judgment. Now, this isn't an easy message to preach because... I held off a long time before doing it. But just like in, Eze in Ezekiel, it says you have to warn the people. For we must, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Joel, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. When that day of judgment comes, as it says, it's going to be the good things you did, the bad things you did, and it doesn't matter if you did more good than you did bad, as in the scales of justice. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you're not getting in. You have the bad and you have the good. Now, once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, once you accept him, you receive his righteousness. And all the bad stuff is wiped away because Jesus paid that price already. And then you only judge all the good things you and you, what you receive a crown for. I think that's a pretty good, <laughs> that's a pretty good deal, considering we're not the ones who had to do it, and it's a free gift. It's a free gift of God. And here we go. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. This one really came to me as well. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Amen. To be saved, I believe it's Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, that you have to confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation is being saved. Now I spoke about this before. If you was drowning in an ocean and if someone came by in a boat and they threw out a life raft and you were treading water and it was only a matter of time before you was going to go down. Someone threw out a life raft. You would jump for that thing, wouldn't you? Like there's no tomorrow. Well, Jesus already put out that raft. 
And if you're sitting there treading water, say, no, I struggle, I'm good. No, you're not good. Jump onto that raft really quick. Jump onto that. Jump onto anything that God is giving you. He already paid that price. And every word that you say, you have to be careful of. You have to be careful of every word. There's a lot of times I know in my past, I'm not proud of, that, you know, I always knew who the Lord was, but this was before I uh, was saved and really gave my heart to God and really started reading the Bible and knew what it meant, what being saved meant. I used to, you know, somehow I used to come up with jokes, really bad jokes. And I don't mean, you know, I mean, just if someone's saying jokes against me, I'm going to say jokes back. And something will come up that's real mean and cruel. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get him. And there's this voice that says, don't do it. Don't do it. And I'd be like, nah, but he got me good. <laughs> it's payback time. And then I'll say it, and everyone will laugh. And that person will put his head down. And I'm like, I won. And then deep down inside, I get that conviction. Like, oh, you know, you shouldn't have said that. You know that was wrong. And you're like, and you just, you know, and then the rest of the day you don't feel good. And they're like, hey, what's wrong with you, Greg? You know, you know, one thing I have to say uh, from my mother, I think I got, you know, from her and the way she raised me, my mother and my father, as you know, I knew whenever I was doing wrong, I would know it. You know, it was, it was just there, you know. So, you know, I would feel bad about it. And that's what God does. He brings conviction to let you know what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And every word, even that word, I have, to, I, I have to give an account for that in everything I say. But when I found out about Jesus, when I started reading his word, and it's one thing to hear about it from somebody like me to come up here and tell you about it. But man, when you open that Bible and you start reading, the, it opens up. It's another world opens up. It's another place. You're in another dimension. God will take you somewhere you've never been before wonderful place and people are missing out on one of the greatest gifts there is. you can thrive for money you can try and get the best job the best cars and everything but there is nothing better than the word of God because it is living and it is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword Amen. going back to that you have a right to remain silent The word says that uh, we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to wrath. It says that for a reason. When Isaiah went up before God, he said, I am undone. When he seen the glory of God, he said, I am undone. For I'm around undone people. And quickly they got a coal to cleanse his lips. Because the things that come out of our mouths can be so horrible. I'm just as guilty. But thank God Jesus took that away from me. Thank God God took that away from me. And every time God's voice tells me, don't say this, and don't say that, I just keep my mouth shut. And there's more to go. There's more and more and more. You know, it's just not like, you know, you get saved and that's it. A lot of people think that, you know, once you receive Christ, that that's it. You can sit back and relax now. And that's not the case. Everything, you know, you, you, know, you got a, gold, a golden parachute. But either things can, bad things can still happen to you then. You're not always going to be happy. But you will have joy. You will have joy because, you know, never mind this, what, let's say we live to be 100 years old. Compare that to eternity. And the best place ever. And, and, and then compare hell for eternity, which is a place of torment. I don't know if anyone's ever been tormented before. But when I was a kid, I had a big brother. He was... Excellent in sports. You know, he would, uh, anybody ever picked on me, he would beat him up. You know, everybody, no one would mess with me because of him. And he was extremely talented in sports and everything. Well, he used to wrestle when I was younger. He used to try to toughen me up. And his way of toughening me up was he would hold down my arms and take his knuckle and drive it into my chest. Ever have that done to you? And he would, and oh man, it would hurt, and there was nothing I could do. And it was like, ah, uh, so, you know, that was like torment. And he was like, this is good for you, man. This is going to toughen you up, toughen you up. 
And even through that, he would come and grab me, and they, there was different wrestling moves, like um, the guillotine, the can opener. Anyone that wrestles know what that is. That's when you grab someone's head and their arm, and then you take their leg, and you twist them in a different direction. It's extremely painful. And he used to do that all the time. And I, and I, I said to him, I said, why, why, what are you doing? <laughs> And he would say, hey, listen, man. I was like, you won't let anybody mess with me, but you, you, you do this to me, and you're, you're stronger than they are. And he said, you know what? You're my brother. You're my blood brother. They don't have the right to do that to you. I do. And it was, <laughs> it was, it, it, it was a horrible experience, but later on when I got bigger, if someone came to try and hurt me, that pain wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt. I mean, it's not defending what he did, but there was a, a method to the madness, and I do mean madness. Anyway, imagine being tormented for the rest of your life, for eternity. And that's real. Do you really want to gamble with that? It's not something you want to gamble with. We are, every single day, just as I was talking about the lawyers and the prosecutors, we are building a case. There won't be any lawyers and prosecutors in the day of judgment. Everything we do and everything we say, we are our own prosecutors because we're bringing judgment on ourselves when we do the wrong things. And we are our lawyers when we do the right things. So everything you say and you do depends upon everything you say and you do will be brought up. And, and as a prosecutor, when you do the bad thing, you're bringing this stuff against yourself. You have no one to blame but yourself. But when you're doing the right thing, and the best thing to do is receive Je the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And just to point, make that perfectly clear what Lord and Savior means, if he's not your Lord, he's not going to be your Savior. Your Lord means master. That means I give myself completely to you. My whole life, everything I have, I'll give to you. But the thing is, a lot of times we have control and we don't want to give it over to God. We don't want to give it over to Jesus. You don't want to give your power over to anyone. I remember when I first heard that word submission, I said, I got a problem with submission. Because, you know, like on TV, when you see people getting submitted, it, it doesn't look good. And bad things happen to them. And that's when you submit to the devil. When you submit to God. God's going to make sure everything's all right. Even in the bad time, God's going to come and minister to your heart and make you feel better. You ever meet somebody in Christ who was going through a lot and still smiling, saying they have joy? I remember a man who was a spiritual leader at one time, and he was sick, and he was dying. He had the tubes, and he was able to walk around with the tubes. He used to, be, you know, he used to teach. And I said, oh, man, I feel so bad for you, I, you know. You know, I'm praying for you every day. We feel so bad for you. He said, don't feel bad for me. Look me square in the eye. I said, don't feel bad for me. He said, God promised me he's going to heal me. That's what his word says. But if it's not in his will, I'm going to heaven. It's a no-lose situation. It's a win-win. And I looked at everything differently. I said, oh, wow. That's what I want. There was no fear of death. You know, what can man do to you? What can man-made diseases do to you? What can uh, the devil, demonic de diseases do to you? What can anything do to you when you have a place promised in heaven? You have nothing to fear when you have Christ. But when you don't have Christ, you have a lot to fear. Because the devil's going to be on you all the time. And unfortunately, he has a legal right when you're sinning to come after you. I mean, he has to come to God for permission on everything. But God's not, a, he, God's not man that he would lie, a son of God that he would have to repent. If you're sinning, if you're doing something wrong, the devil has a legal right to come after you. But once you get Jesus Christ in your life, once you accept Jesus Christ, all those bad things you did, wiped away. And when I was saying earlier about the judgment, uh, that the judgment uh, comes first to the house of the Lord, that's why when we become saved, we want to move on to holiness and sanctification. We want to get 
be more and more like Christ. The, 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 one of the definitions of Christian is being Christ-like, being just like Christ. When they look at you and they're like, hey, this guy, is, he's nice, he's blessing people, he, you never hear him saying a bad word to anyone. That's, that's, when I, before I became, truly started reading the Bible, my brother, who was, man, he, you know, he used to be a bouncer, he used to, uh, he was pretty good at fighting. Anyway, he, uh, one day, he just gave his life to Christ. And he used to say it to me, and I used to say, yeah, right, whatever. Because before I was all innocent and nice, my brother was trying to toughen me up and get me rougher. And I was, pretty much, physically and, you know, uh, on the outside, just, you know, the way I spoke. And one day he came to me, and he was telling me about Jesus. And I laughed at him. I said, really? Man, get out of here. And I said something foul to him. He said, no, I'm serious. So I said, hey, you know, what, what, what are you talking about? I was like, you have a nerve to come to me. You're the one who taught me this stuff in the first place. I don't want to hear this. <laughs> get, get out of here. And I said something obscene to him. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, I'm sorry. I know I did that and I'm sorry. And it was then that I seen Christ in him. And that's when I said, that's what I want. My other brother, I had two brothers that was something else. My other brother, he was like a swindler. He was like Jacob. He, would, he was the type of person where he could borrow money from you, from somebody, and then come back and borrow more money. And then come back and borrow more money. Because he had the gift of gab. And he, man, he was just a swindler to everybody. And everyone would say, man, he owes me money. But, man, I love that guy. <laughs> and one day he, he, he found the Lord. And he came, but he came and seen him. He drove to me, got me in a car, and was talking to me. He was like, he had, he had money. He wasn't drinking anymore. Everything was, was right. He made everything right with his family. And I said, I want that. And it got to the point where I was the only one in the family that wasn't saved. And God was faithful. And God's faithful with you. You have a chance at this very moment to go before the judgment seat of Christ, and then go to heaven and be forgiven of all your sin. But that's a choice. You can say no. God's love is, God doesn't just want to have robots. God's love, his perfect love, is giving us a chance to say yes or no. That's how much he loves us. So it's your choice. But whether you believe me or not, you will stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, it's off of me right now, everything, because I've told you. And also, me personally have to live this myself. I can't just say it and not live it myself, because there's even a tougher judgment on me if I'm preaching it and I'm not doing it. But I won't be there when you go on judgment, on the judgment seat. You can't look back and say, Greg, speak up for me. No, I won't be there. Even if I was, I'd be worried about speaking up for myself. You're going to be alone with God. And he's going to say, well, how come you did not receive that free gift that cost me everything? I was beaten. I don't know if everyone, anyone's ever been beaten before or see someone get beaten. Bloodied, disgraced, put the thorn thing on it, made fun of him. He came down knowing that's what he had to face to save us and still did it. Would you do the same for someone? What would you do for someone who loved you that much? And he did it so you can live. Well, time's dwindling down. Receive the free gift from Christ, salvation. You can receive it now or you can receive it later. But tomorrow's not promised. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And then when you go to sleep and you wake up, you're before the judgment seat. And you can't say you didn't know. Everybody stand for prayer. So here it is. Here's my whole case. You want to go before the judgment seat of God. You care, sometimes you care more about what man can do to you and you forget about what can be done to you. Every 
we are all guilty of sin. We have a sin nature. Only God can take that away. I'm speaking to the I'm t- speaking to the people who don't have salvation. But right now you have an opportunity to come on down here. It's a free will. You can do it now. You can do it later. Doesn't you know? There's no pressure. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force you to do anything. So I'm giving you an opportunity right now to come down here. And don't do it for me. Don't do it for your parents. Don't do it for your friends. Do it for you. Because it's you that's going to be at that judgment seat. And one day when you wake up and see Jesus, you're going to say, oh, he was right. So you have a chance to come down to this altar as I'm praying. Father, I thank you for another beautiful and blessed night, Lord. I thank you for each and every person down here. I pray, Lord, that the people who didn't come down here already received salvation or a seed was planted and eventually they will uh, receive salvation. But most of all, Father, I pray that you just bless each and every man, woman, and child that's in this building, Lord. I pray that you will prosper each and every one of them. That, you, that they will all be successful spiritually, Father. That you will fill them with the Spirit. But f- for most of all, I pray that you will give each and every person conviction before tem- whenever temptation comes up. You will give them conviction so they can walk away from that temptation. But most of all, I pray for each and everyone's salvation. I thank you, I bless you, and I praise you. I pray that every person here has a good night's sleep, Father, and wake up to see your marvelous light once again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.